I suppose what's really in my head at the moment is why when we need change so much, when we need to go from structures to systems, have we been so very, very slow at doing this? What is the resistance to change? And why are we in the workforce crisis we're in now? And how do we get out of it? Uh, and I hope I'll explain this, but I've written it really so we could have perhaps at least five minutes of discussion at the end. So it's meant to be challenging and you don't have to agree. It's trying to think of what's happening and why we are where we're now. And my argument will be that it's because education hasn't kept up with what we need um, that we are where we are now. Uh, and it's really around why education needs to change. So that the quote came from Rachel Carson, who I don't really remember wrote um, Silent Spring. Uh, and it's about the fact that a story of the earth. And, and I was really relating that to the lines of Nazca in South Peru. Now those lines have been drawn in the sand. I don't know whether, you know, I, unfortunately when I was in Peru, I went on the Inca Trail where some of the group flew over to look at these. But they were done in the desert from about 500 BC and they're still there because the way it was ingrained in the sand. And I think in a way, if we're trying to think what happens, we are, as you say, Jane, in a world of shifting sands. And I, I blame myself that we haven't managed to move education on. But in fact, if you think about it, the challenge is huge. We live in, I'll read it out because of the distance. We live in a world where change is exponential, exponential and we're helping to prepare students for jobs that don't yet exist using technologies that haven't been invented in order to solve problems that we don't know are problems yet. And if you think when I trained, if you had an infarct, a heart attack, you were in bed, we had young men in bed for 28 days with a bedpan and they weren't allowed out of bed at all. And if you think now you can go in and have your stent and you can be back at work within a week. Huge change, and I will come to some others later, that we'd never have thought of. Cataracts lay on the bed in this darkened ward with Sister Allahan for 48 hours when nobody dared move or make a noise in case it all slipped. Huge, huge change. So it's a huge responsibility for us to prepare our students for this uncertainty, for this change, challenge, and emergence or self-created opportunity. And I remember Terence Stevens standing up and saying, well, I've managed it, Val, you know, 50 years on, I can still do that. But I, I'm not sure that given the challenges ahead, we shouldn't be thinking much more about what actually are we training the doctors of the future for. So what is holding us back? And what I want to share with you and ask you to think about, is it the fact that we like to draw lines in the sand? And this is a quote from Gillian Tett um, from a book, The Silo Effect, that talks about civilised societies and how we've always felt the need. We want to classify, we want to categorise, and we want to specialise. And it's efficient, and it gives leaders a sense that they know what they're doing and a sense of confidence that they've got the right people focusing on the right tasks. But, she goes on to say, it can be catastrophic and it leading to tunnel vision and tribalism. And as you know, much of, you may know or not know if you've read the By Choice, Not By Chance report, much of what comes out of that is the tribalism within the medical profession and how I feel we really must get out of that. So why do we always want these structures? And I don't know whether some of you have read the Bengoa report from North Ireland where he's saying we must move from structures to systems and yet healthcare services really are not doing that. So why? Why do we need it? And I want to talk about what needs to change, and I want to talk about three divides that I really think we need to tackle. One is generalism versus specialism. One is primary care versus secondary care. And then finally, undergraduate versus postgraduate. And it's interesting, Jane, how a lot of it will resonate a bit of what you're saying but perhaps from a more of an educational angle. And then I was going to leave the end for where is the leadership for change for the discussion a bit more, Jim, and how we take this forward. How many of you have read the Lancet Report 2010 on educating health professionals for the 21st century? It's really interesting because it's such a good report and yet it seems to have totally lain fallow. But there's an actual fundamental thing in this report 
which is the, it's the population that's driving us. It's the population's needs that are driving what the workforce needs. So as we all know, we're driven now by the problems of ageing and comorbidity and much greater pressure on our services. And that's de delivered by the population. So that drives the health system. Jane, you're talking about the workforce we need to meet the population. But what people have ignored and not worked nearly enough on is the fact that education system produces that workforce. So unless the education system can parallel what you're trying to do and what the population is driving in terms of health, it doesn't keep up. And in fact, as I say later, the report makes it quite clear that unless education changes, um, then we won't produce the sort of workforce, Jane, you're wanting. And this behoves us, I will argue, right down the chain. And what's happening at the moment, and I've, the report had various reports, I think the most fundamental thing that's holding us back is that we can't get the money for education out of secondary care to follow students much more where the patients are, which is more in the primary care and community, and we're still struggling five years on to get a, an equal tariff. But there's negativism everywhere, and I think what the medical students told us in the report they get from GPs, but also, I'm sure, for, we've lost Damien, but from hospital specialists. How many here are primary care, and how many are second? Who's primary care? Great. And who's secondary care? Good. So that's great. So it's a nice, nice balance there. I think they're getting it as well from you in secondary care, from consultants, saying, don't do this job, it's awful. And undoubtedly, I think, of all the things we found in the report, that finance first, but the negativism second, is probably what part of our problem is at the moment. And I don't know how you solve that. I'd be interesting to think if you have ideas on that. But it's certainly what the medical students told us, but six, particularly when they're with GPs, because well, that's what we were focusing on. So negativism's now a thing, but there are many global challenges. I've lost Cathy in the room. I'm looking for her orange dress. Oh, there you are, <laughs> right. I mean, but these are all the things that when we're designing our new curriculum, Cathy, and I know you're thinking about, we need to think about as we move forward. I don't know whether you would even see. Can you read the writing right at the back? Not really. So this is talking about the challenges, which would be globalization, migration, and I recently in Slovenia saw some GPs who tried to tackle this group of migrants coming across Slovenia into Austria and had been totally upset because they had none of the skills to deal with them, which was rapid consultations, no language barriers, and no drugs. So there are issues coming for that. Climate change um, in Oman, it was nearly, it was well over the 40s, hugely hot, unbearably hot, and really causing a lot of problems there. Urbanization, aging, technology, um, comorbidity and non-communicable diseases, new diseases, antibiotic resistance, which you mentioned as well, Citizen's voice with a picture of Trump on the front. I mean, what's happening politically? And of course, rising costs. Now, I could probably talk for 15 minutes on each of those, and I don't know how much you're addressing them in your curriculum here. But I think mostly, just today, I'll just talk about technology. Because we talked, Jane, you talked about the millennials and how different they are. Well, even in Man, it's the same problem. Um, blaming the young for not wanting to come not coming to lectures. Do yours come to lectures, Cathy? Not turning up for lectures and not seeming to be as engaged as they were. But they're a different generation, born for another time. And why do we find it so hard to engage with that? And why do we blame them for being different when the fact is they are different? They've got the internet. Why are we filling them full of facts just in case they need them when it's on their phone already? And what goodness knows where it will be in 10 or 20 years time. So what are we doing with our education? Um, there was an educationist, it was on Private Passions on Radio 3, who said, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we assessing people like this? When in fact, if you took primary school children, gave them a problem with a computer, and they would have solved it in 10 minutes. It's, it's, we've really got to get our heads around the technology and how we need to train our training. And comorbidity too. How can we teach them in silos of specialty when in fact, in future, they're going to be dealing such a comprehensive thing. And why we've got so specialized, how are we going to tackle that? I had cardiologists at Keele who said they couldn't teach year three students how to do a respiratory examination. We really must try and get out of that mindset. 
um, and work forward. It's nobody's fault, but it just is, I believe, a line in the sand that's causing us problems. So if we look more broadly and internationally at the sustainable development goals, the Millennium Goals worked very well where they were vertical within specialties, where it was improving malaria or improving HIV. They didn't work so well with the much more comprehensive ones, which required us to work together, um, like the maternal mortality or pediatric health. So when the Sustainable Development Goals came out, people were really wife is only one out of 17 that's the um, climate that's um, good health and well-being only one out of 17 why only one out of 17 around health whereas in fact so much of this is around what our students need of the future I think they'll need to know about climate change reduced health inequalities how are they going to handle those and also clean water and sanitation and I was in Slovenia recently, and the year ones were moaning about their public health teaching, say they're teaching us about dirty water. And, and in fact, if you think about it, if you think about Hawaii and the problems there, the whole health problems there became from dirty water. So I don't know how you're doing here about thinking about bringing population as well as individual health care into what we're learning for the future. But undoubtedly, it's going to be what's needed, that we need to broaden into those areas. And I don't know where Ian is in the room, but I hear you're doing much more multi-professional education now. There's so many mid-level healthcare workers coming in. What will be the role of the doctor in the future? How are they going to be working with them? You're saying perhaps there'll be less psychiatrists, but there will be much more, I think, if I think about it, managing teams. So we should be training the doctors of future much more to manage, perhaps, rather than to actually have the basic skills just a thought. So there's a lot within the goals to be thinking about and trying to broaden our education to make it more socially accountable and to make it think much forward into how we save our planet and, save, um, and think much more globally and culturally. Now this, I'm sorry, it doesn't project very well because in fact I only got it last week when I went to hear a talk by um, Rachel Bengoa who wrote this report. Um, from structures to systems, which is about the social care and delivery. The green is scientific discovery here. So that's the, if you look from now to 10 years, what needs to, in, how each intervention will impact on health care. So a very low impact for research. And yet most, of, a lot of the hospital deans are arguing that we have to really maintain a high level of research in our medical schools, and that's why the universities will do better than some of the new schools, Cathy, is the argument, but you can use this to show probably not. Cost is the brown, and Bengoa, Raquel Bengoa argues cost, and Theresa May putting all the money in, long term will make very little impact. What does need to happen is new ways of delivering health, as you're saying, Jane, that's the blue. Focus on population health, my argument for changing medical education and much more around quality and productivity process for improvement. So that in itself is quite a good framework for which to move forward. And some of you I'm sure will have seen this output. Do medical schools matter? Well yes, they clearly make a difference on the workforce they produce. You can see here you've got the medical schools up there on the left, all the UK ones. The blue is those that go into general practice, the red psychiatry, and the green other, and of course the biggest dilemma is 50% don't seem to go into core training at the end of foundation. But there's a big difference. It's, it varies from year to year, but it does seem that the new medical schools do better in the output. It could be they're selecting different people. It could be a lot of things, but there's now some evidence that's coming out. Tom Gale in, in Exeter, because we collect now, the Medical School Council collect all the data of how students perform in medical school and they look and look forward to how they work later on. And he's been able to show that if you take all the other variables out, the medical school that they went to makes a difference into their future and whether they apply for general practice training or not. And this is a graph from Hugh Alberti in the British Journal of General Practice showing that the longer you expose students to general practice, then the more likely, that if they get proper GP teaching, that's hands-on in the schools, 
then that they're more likely um, to go into general practice. It's a bit fickle if you took one or two points out, but it's, it's beginning to be a trend to show that it is partly what we do with students when we educate them. And the Lancet report says 20th century educational strategies are unfit to tackle 21st century challenges. So what should we do? So I just want to dwell a little on these three divides that bug me a bit. May not bug you, but they bug me. And the first line in the sand is generalism versus specialism. And I am uncomfortable, Jane, with us calling ourselves expert generalists as GPs. When the job report from generalism came out, and again, I'll read this out for those in the back, it was that generalist knowledge is characterized by a perspective on the whole rather than the parts, on relationships and processes rather than components and facts, and on judicious context-specific decisions on how and what individual family systems consider a problem. That was the definition, sorry, couldn't find the word, of um, generalism that they used then. I think every doctor should have those skills. I think secondary care doctors should be equally as generalists <coughs> because they ought to be thinking about everybody and the, popu the family and the thing. And that's the only way they'll be able to deliver future health care. What I think the students told us they wanted to hear about primary care in medical school was it's, it's, an general, it's this European definition, which is that family medicine is an academic and scientific discipline with its own educational content research, evidence-based and clinical activ activity, and a clinical specialty orientated to primary care. So for me, we're not doing that, the students tell us. We, we don't have departments of primary care, we don't have the academics. Only 6% of all clinical academics are GPs. And it's something we really need to, to tackle, I think. And so why? Why can't GPs be specialists? As that's probably how medical students would like to see us. And why can't we all be generalists? Why do we make that divide? It just doesn't make sense to me for the future. And I do believe that if, we general, if students are going to want to be GPs, what they tell us this millennium is they want to see it. And students will say, one student said, if I want to do research, I won't go into general practice. But then look at that slide of the development goals, all those things we face, that will have to be dealt with in primary care. And where so much research needs to happen. So primary and secondary care, another line in the sand, which increasingly doesn't make sense as we look at our new health systems. So the by choice, not by chance report talks a lot about tribalism. This we hear masses from students about you're too bright to be a GP, or have you failed an exam, or that you can go into GP then. And then, but we, we, we thought long and hard about it, and there's been a lot of talk about denigration. And in fact, destination GP goes back to denigration. My personal feeling, as I may be wrong, is that's quite the wrong approach. GPs will never pull ourselves, we won't pull ourselves up if we be victims. We need to show that we're, we're that you know, we're a specialty worth it. As I'm very uncomfortable with denigration. And it's a tribalism because it, it's a, it's a two-way system. I'm quite sure some of you are rude about consultants if you're in general practice. And I'm sure consultants we hear are rude. It's a two-way system. I'll tell you, I shouldn't really tell this joke and I hope I don't offend anyone in this room, but it is two-way. I was in Bangkok just having a meal in Chinatown on the pavement and some, uh, he, Somebody in the group told us this joke. And there are three brains. Somebody's trying to sell three brains to a transplant surgeon. So one is from a GP, and he's going to charge a thousand pounds for that. One is from a cardiologist, and he's going to charge three thousand pounds for that. And one is for an orthopedic surgeon, and that's ten thousand pounds. So he said, well, why ten thousand pounds? That's an awful lot. He said, well, it's hardly ever been used. <laughs> <laughs> so we all do it. It's a, it's a two-way process. But I do think we need to recognise, and Terence Stevens said, don't put it in the report, Val, it's been there forever and it won't make any difference. It does impact on students. So we do have to stop this banter. And it's with, among us all. We're all it's, it's natural and it's meant to be banter and it's not meant to be nasty, but it does impact. And we can do it. Plymouth have done some nice work by trying to explain to students about the hidden curriculum 
about how not always to listen when people are denigrating each other within the thing. Good thing I'm aware of the hidden curriculum, otherwise his speech might have influenced my career aspirations. So at least if we can make them aware of it, it will help. I also think students should have much more assertive training so that they can actually challenge some of these um, the th undercurrents they experience in our workplace. But above all, it behoves us to change. And I think we should take that line away from the sand and work much more together across that divide. And it's there. I mean, I've worked across it myself. Finally, undergraduates and postgraduates. And here we come together, Jane, again. When I was in Manchester, I used to have this train. And I'm sorry, Jim, it's a bit, the, the wheels are falling off and it's getting a bit old, but it was very hard finding a bridge in the desert to fit with the sand. And it was University Foundation to Training to CBD as being a continuum. And if you remember when they wrote the foundation curriculum, they said students had to learn to taste blood, take blood. And in the universities, we say, but we taught them in year two to take blood. You know, what are you doing? So it had to be rewritten. But I think now what I think is absolutely essential is that we start in schools. It came out it, from the report and it seems widening participation. You're doing quite well up here, Jim, aren't you, in that? But it all has to be start with us going into schools to raise expectations and to produce this workforce that we need for the future. We're far too social class one or two in terms of tackling the things that come ahead. Um, it may have improved slightly to 20%, but when we were doing the report, 25% of UK secondary schools had never sent a pupil into medicine. It's shocking. And I think you're doing outreach work, are you, Cathy? Getting, I think we need to go out into schools. We need to tell them what medicine is. I personally think we need to be thinking very carefully what type of person we select. I'm not sure we need people who can assimilate facts very well and regurgitate them in their A-levels. I think we need different skills for the future, particularly if we're thinking about the role of the doctor much more with a whole screw of people underneath us. So that's my train about. So where's the leadership for change? Well, I love this quote, which I'll read out again, is those who learn to operate in a vastly changing global environment, which we're in, those who can walk on quicksand and dance with electrons, those who amass an array of valid experiences, and those who see connections where others see chaos will flourish and find opportunity in every disturbance which kind of makes me think that we need to be thinking how we select. And if we have time for discussion, perhaps that's we, what we could think about. But I do think we need a different type of approach. And I would hope, if we go back to those lines in the sand, that this one which I started with, which is my three divides, but it's certainly rather divide, that we would be moving together before it is a refreshing to have a much more, this is sort of joined up kind of man, if you can't see it at the back, without these wretched lines between us all. So my argument is perhaps we need to think about ourselves and how we like to be so organized and efficient. And that perhaps if we are to meet the millenniums and their different expectations for the future, we need to be thinking much more broadly about how we educate in them in terms of how they learn and how they need to become much more social accountable and how we need to be thinking that they need to look after populations as well as patient needs. So I thought I'd end with this because I think it's light in the tunnel. And this is Bruce Quejo's quote um, that we used in the report. And I think it shows, and I think there is, as we're together in this room, secondary primary care, I think everybody in this room recognises what a GP does and how difficult it is and how it differs from the secondary care role because he says it's a really hard job. GPs have to be clinically, intellectually and emotionally strong. I can say this as a cardiac surgeon, where all our patients come to us kind of worked up. But day in, day out, general practitioners are having to sort out the wheat from the chaff to identify major clinical problems masquerading as minor ailments. It requires a lot of intellectual flexibility and people have to be really tolerant individuals. It's one of the hardest jobs in medicine. I think all our healthcare is moving in a direction that will, will require those sort of intellectually challenging skills.